and already it's just delightful to be here and open up the book of John and know that we're going to spend all weekend in this one book of the Bible allowing us to fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus. So, <clears throat> this is an exegesis of John 1. Every time I hear that word, exegesis, I'm reminded of the son that went to a seminary to study to be a preacher. And he wasn't there a week until he called home. He said, Daddy, come get me. I'm ready to come home. I said, well, what's the matter, son? He said, I got up this morning and went to Bible class and this this professor started talking about this extra Jesus. <laughs> and I know there's only one Jesus in the Bible. He started talking about this extra Jesus. And so the father said, well, I'll tell you what, you just stay another week or two and, and hang in there. I think they'll all work out. So two weeks later, he called and said, Daddy's got my bags packed. Time for you to come and pick me up. I am no longer staying here. What's wrong now, son? He said, well, today the professor, that same professor got up and he started talking about, he said, he said, I's a Jesus, and I know he's not the Lord. <laughs> so exegesis, I's a Jesus, what in the world? Of course, one means to glean out of the Scriptures. Exegesis, trying to see the interpretation and glean from the Scriptures what is actually said. This particular session, the assignment is the Logos of John 1. What a funky title. Who talks like that? I mean, really? That is a title or an assignment made by preachers for preachers. Am I not right? So let's just take some time for just a moment and think about the assignment itself. <clears throat> the Logos. Now from your deep dives, I'm sure you know that that's the term that is translated in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. <clears throat> to the Jewish and the Greek mind, they came to a concept of what Logos was all about that's intriguing. The Jewish mind would look at the concept of Logos as the reason. So here's a term. There is reasoning behind that term, and that term is the vehicle by which the reason is projected. So, to the Jewish mind, Logos is the rhyme and reason of things. Back 600, almost 600 years before Jesus, to the Greek mind, the word Logos had a similar concept. There was a philosopher that said that everything, everything was in a state of flux. One of his favorite illustrations of that was you never step in the same river twice. He said you could step in this river, you put your foot in this river once, pick it up, and put it right back in the same place, but you've not stepped in the same river because the water has flowed away. What you stepped into has flowed away, and now new water is coming in. Everything in life is like that. It's in constant motion. It's in a state of flux. And he said, what keeps it from everything from digressing into mass confusion is logos. And so it, logos to the Greek mind held everything together. So in the beginning was the rhyme and reason of everything who holds everything together. Logos. The Logos of John. Chapter 1. John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first four books of the New Testament, of course. As you think about Matthew, it sets before us the plan of God. It starts right off by telling us that Jesus is indeed the son of Abraham, the son of David. And it directs us, the whole book, to Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament predictive prophecy relative to the Messiah, specifically the King of the Jews. And so Matthew sets before us Jesus as the fulfillment of God's plan. The book of Mark sets before us the power of Jesus. It is Mark that reveals to us more of the miracles than any of the other Gospels individually. And so you see the power of God through Jesus as you study through the book of Mark. Come to the book of Luke, and Luke is all about Jesus and people. 
He is a people person. It's Jesus reaching out to the disenfranchised. Jesus reaching out to the marginalized. Women, children, tax collectors, sinners. Jesus involving Himself with people. But then you come to the book of John. And John is the other Gospel. That's how it's called. It's not the synoptics. Synoptics, optics, seeing. Sin, from the Greek term soon together, seeing together. Therefore, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, are three Gospels that view the life of Jesus somewhat similar, in a similar fashion. But when you come to John, it is totally different. It's in John that you will find the seven sayings of Jesus. It's in John that you will find seven specific miracles. It's in John that you will find seven special discourses. And John doesn't engage in a chronology. He doesn't try to uh, reflect on the life of Jesus, reflect uh, involved in people's lives, performing miracles, Jesus the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. John says, this is God's Son. Simply put, this is God's Son. So, in our class today, we are focusing upon the rhyme and reason who holds everything together because He is God's Son. The Logos of John chapter 1. Now, when we're in John chapter 1, we find ourselves in the prologue of the book. Just It starts and sets things in motion. And from the prologue of the book, you find the preparation of Jesus' ministry through the work of John the Baptizer. And that's John chapter 1. So we've been given the assignment <clears throat> to focus upon the rhyme and reason of everything holding things together because He's the Son of God as set forth in the book of John, in particular, the first chapter of the book. That said, we put our finger on the pulse of John chapter 1 and what I want to accomplish is this. I want you to realize how absolutely special this man who was more than a man really was. I fear that all too often in our minds Jesus is a figure of history who came to save mankind for which we're thankful. And I fear that He's not as special to us as He should be. If I could pause for a moment to a sidebar. Historically, we have been known as a people who emphasize fellowship. And as a result, we put an exclamation mark behind authority. The authority of God dictates that with which and those with whom we can or cannot fellowship. Historically, that's where we have placed a bold exclamation mark. That's not a bad thing. At the same time, historically, the largest Protestant denomination in the world has placed an emphasis on relationships. And in particular, a relationship with Jesus. And they, as a result, put an exclamation mark behind emotion. We put an exclamation mark behind reason. I'm suggesting that neither is right in itself. You can't have a relationship with God without Jesus. And you can't have a relationship with Jesus without yielding to proper authority. You have to blend them together, brethren. And so let's remember that God said, I will write my laws where? on their heart and in their mind. Or, if you went three chapters later, I will write my laws 
on their minds and in their hearts. He said the same thing in reverse. He wants us to know that in the balance to be centrist, we have to have a logical and an emotional emphasis to our Christianity. Equally so on this sidebar, historically, we have talked about the church of Christ. And we talk about the church all the time. That's not a bad thing. We need to make certain that when we say church, we are saying church the way the New Testament says church. Amen? Amen. But we've placed a lot of attention on the church and I'm wondering if we've placed as much attention on the Christ of the church. Here's what I have seen in 55 years of preaching. Listening to great preaching. Not to be disparaging in any way, but I want us to drive this home. You turn to the book of Acts, and the first thing that Peter did, speaking as the Spirit gave him utterance, was talk about Jesus. He talked about Christ. Then when you, they were asked the question, what shall we do? They set before them the conditions of salvation, that is how you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Those that listened to the conditions and yielded to the same were added to them in that day about 3,000 souls and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. You had Christ was preached, conditions were set before them, conditions were met and the church was established. Christ conditions church. Historically, historically, we have flipped that. And we, in our emphases, talk about the church and the conditions for becoming members of the church, in particular baptism, and Christ becomes a side issue at best. That is wrong. That is wrong. And so I believe what we need to do is to make sure we without fail let people hear about the church of Christ and let people hear about the Christ of the church. It's not the church of Christ denomination. You know that. Amen? Amen? The world doesn't. Do you know what the world thinks when they think of you? When they think of us? The Church of Christ, that's the denomination that's over there on the corner of Lehman Avenue. And that's what they're thinking. That's not accurate. But that's what they're thinking. And when they ask, are you the ones that think you're the only ones going to heaven? What they're actually saying is, Oh, your denomination thinks it's the best denomination of all and your denomination is the only denomination going to heaven. That's the way the world thinks. We've got to buck that and teach them the church concept and the church concept is an assembling group of special people forgiven by God, knowing His mercy, who belong to Christ. Now all of that set as a sidebar. I want us to study John chapter 1 to see how special Jesus is. Not to take away from the importance of the church or teaching and preaching about the church. No! But to emphasize the importance of teaching and preaching about Jesus. Our young people need to fall in love with Jesus. And if our young people fall deeply in love with Jesus properly... There's no problem with their stumbling and falling into the world and leaving and going to denominations if they fall in love with Jesus properly. But if we, by rote memory, teach them what to say in response to what question, and it's just a matter of data that they have put into their minds and not into their hearts, look out. Look out. I can speak from personal experience. In the darkest hours of my life as, and, and, and that of our family, being a member of the right church didn't come to my heart. But the involvement of Jesus as the one sitting next to God calling me by name, the reality of Jesus sitting at God's side, being on my side, meant everything in the world to me. And it is literally what got me through one day after another after another. We must teach our brethren to fall deeply in love with Jesus. 
not to take away from the importance of those that belong to Jesus' the church, but to have a centrist, balanced emphasis. Now, as we approach John chapter 1, that's what I want to try to do. I want us to see how special Jesus is, how special Jesus should be to us. That said, John chapter 1 falls into two sections. You have the testimony of John the Apostle in the prologue, and you have the testimony of John the Baptist in the preparatory work for Jesus' ministry. So our thoughts relative to how special Jesus is will fall into those two segments. Let's begin by looking at the testimony of John the Apostle, and that would be John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. As we take pause for a moment and think about John the Apostle, we would think of him, of course, as our Lord's best friend. I love to read the words of John, 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, to step inside the heart of John the Apostle. I want us to see how John the Apostle felt about Jesus. John, our Lord's best friend. John 1 verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. Pause. The word seen translates a perfect tense verb, meaning something happened back there in the past and the consequences remain to this day. It's as if John is saying, we saw that. And it's like I can still see it happening today. I saw Jesus walk on the water and I can still see Him one step at a time walking on the water to find gravity. I saw it and I can still see it with the mind's eye. That which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the Word, Lagos of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it perfect tense again. We saw Jesus. And it's like I can still bring Him up in my mind and see Him right now. And we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which, with, with, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen. Again, perfect tense. Seen and can still see. Seen and heard. Translates another perfect tense. I can I re, I remember hearing Jesus preach a sermon on the mount, and it's like I can still hear His voice in my mind and in my in my. I re, Jesus, I was there when Jesus preached those great parables about the kingdom, spoken from a boat to a crowd on the shore, and it's like I can still hear His voice echoing in my mind. I saw Him. I can still see Him. I heard Him. I can still hear Him. I lost a son all 18 years ago. I can't remember His laugh. That bothers me. But I can still remember the sound of His voice as He talked. And that's John right here talking about Jesus. Do you see what Jesus meant to John? He couldn't go anywhere without Jesus being in his mind, in his head, and on his heart. That's the one that we begin to read from in John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Now, as we read through this, we're going to use some special words to more or less quickly summarize what we find in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. The first word is the word eternity. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was 
the light of men. Now I emphasize the word was for a reason. In our English language, was is past tense. They used to be. But every time I read that word was and emphasized it, it translates a Greek term that is called an imperfect tense. And here's, there are different tenses, present tense, continued action, aorist tense, pointed action, something happened back there, perfect tense, something happened back there, the consequences remain. The imperfect tense was something that happened back there, but it's, it's like it's, you look at it and you watch it continuing to develop. And I've had the aorist pointed action in the past distinguished from the imperfect tense continued action in the past with this illustration. The aorist tense is like a Polaroid snapshot. Pause for a moment. How many remember the Polaroid cameras? Okay. Okay, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. You don't have a clue. Now, get my iPhone out, right? Okay. The Polaroid camera. Boom, the snapshot. Okay, on your iPhone, if you put it on photo, click, you've got a still photo. All right? That's the aorist tense. It captures a point in time. If on my iPhone, am I communicating to you? Okay. If on my iPhone, if I slip flip it over here from photo to video huh video and now I push the button I'm taking a video aren't I and I'm capturing what's going on and I can see I can see you going closing your eyes and going to sleep <laughs> I can see you nodding back there in the back I, I can see you laughing and it's all captured on that video so the aorist tense is that photo it's that snapshot just boom, moment in time the imperfect tense is, it's something back there, but you, you get to watch things develop. You know, a series is captured. A series in the past is captured. That's the imperfect. Every time I emphasize the word was in 1 John 1 verses 1 to 8, it is an imperfect tense. And it's like John, John's not saying, I want to tell you about a particular point in time. He could not talk about the rhyme and reason of everything. He could not talk about the one who holds everything together. He could not talk about Lagos in a specific point in time, but it was one that was constantly in existence in the past, yes, in the present, and yes, even in the future. This is the Lagos, the eternity of Jesus is set before us in verses 1 and 2 of First John 1. I want you to see how special Jesus is. He's always been. He has always been. Before He was Jesus, He was the Word. Before He was Christ, He was Jesus. Before He was Lord, He was Christ. Before He is Judge, He is Lord. But He's always been. Ultimately, He will be the submissive Son for all eternity. He's always been, always will be. The eternity of Jesus. But mark it. Though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, that you through His poverty... See that? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here He was, the rhyme and reason of everything, holding everything together. Colossians 1, in Him all things consist, they glued together. There He was, continuing to exist in the past. But everything that He had, even equality with God, He gave up. He became poor. The Greeks had two basic words for poor. One meant one who had little but squeaked out a living. Another meant one who was impoverished, had to beg to exist. It's the latter of the two used in 2 Corinthians 9. He had everything. And He came to nothing but a beggarly existence for you. You and I are nothing more than a speck in a speck in a parenthesis called time. He has always existed, but He gave it up all for us. His eternity. 
The second word in John chapter 1 <clears throat> is the word deity. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word, before becoming Jesus, was deity. He was deity incarnate, God with us, when he became Jesus. Wrap your mind around that one. No way can I try. I cannot talk to you about Jesus being God and Jesus being man without... I just can't fuse the two together in my mind. Maybe you can and you can help me. But Jesus, deity. In Hebrews chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 1 to 3, His deity is also mentioned very briefly. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in the last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His God's nature. The exact imprint of God's nature. Let me spell the Greek word translated imprint. C-H-A-R-K-T-E-R. -E character. Character. The very character of God's nature. The very essence of God is what Jesus possessed as the Word, His deity. Number three, the word creativity. All things, verse 3, were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that hath been made. And therefore, we read in Hebrews chapter 1, He's the one through whom God made the worlds. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, that says there is one God and Father of whom are all things, one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things. Don't miss the different pronouns. All things are of the Father, ek, out of. He drew up the blueprints. But all things are through the Lord Jesus Christ, dia, through His agency. And so it's like God drew up the blueprints from the, for the universe and Jesus is the project manager that put the blueprints into motion and made it happen. And God said, let there be. Those were the very words of Jesus as the Word. Just a little sidebar. Remember in Matthew 19, when Jesus said, Have you not read that He who made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said, Do you know who actually did that making and who actually said that? It was Jesus Himself when He was the Word. That's just so cool to think about. Jesus knows in His mind, don't you know what I did? Don't you remember what I said? Jesus is that Creator. The creativity of God can be seen in John 1, verse 3-13. through 13. We won't have the time, but if you read verses 3-13, through 13, 13, you'll find two words that are found repeatedly throughout the book of John. And that's the word life and the word light. And in reality, Jesus is the creator of three different kinds of life. He's the creator of physical life, the creator of spiritual life, and the creator of eternal life for mankind. And when you think about light, the same can be said as well. Jesus is the creator of physical light, the light properties that give us light. He's the creator of spiritual light and the light of the world. And He's the creator of eternal life in that the heaven has no need of the sun. His glory is what's going to give it light. He's the creator of life and light. His creativity. Next, the fourth word. Eternity, deity, creativity, and now humanity. Verse 14. And the Word, the rhyme and reason of everything, who holds everything together, the Word, Logos, became flesh. Now the word became there translates an aorist tense. The Holy Spirit through John says, at this specific point in time, the Word became something that He wasn't before. He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
the only begotten. I think it's A.T. Robertson in his word pictures suggests that another way to translate would be the only born. The only born. You'll find it in chapter 7. The concept in chapter 7, verse 12. In chapter 8, verse 42, the uh, uh, Syrophoenician woman, the only born child. Uh, Jairus, the only born child. You'll find it in John chapter 9, verse 38 as well. The Word became flesh as the only born, the only begotten of the Father. He was biologically, I say this with the most tremendous amount of respect, He was biologically sired by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a woman. Not by a man, but by the Holy Spirit. And thus Matthew 1.18 says, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when Mary his mother was found with child, ek, out of the Holy Spirit. Something proceeded miraculously out of the Holy Spirit into the womb of Mary, resulting in the conception of Jesus. And therefore the Word became flesh. John 1 verse 14. John 1 15. There's the word charity. Charity. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Verse 16. For from his fullness, from his, the word who became flesh, from his fullness we have received. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 1.9, from His, out, literally out of His fullness, we have received grace upon grace. Philo would use those grace upon grace to capture the idea of graces, plural, in an emphatic way. So, by the fullness of everything Jesus is and everything Jesus offers, look how we have been graced. That's the charity of Jesus in verses 15 and 16. And then last of all, the authority of Jesus. Verses 17 and 18, law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The truth is, came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God... The only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. I can know what God is like, and I can know what God likes because of Jesus and the authority that He was given. And so I have the words, John, the best friend of Jesus, who constantly lived with Jesus in His head and in His heart, or on His heart, begins this prologue and he wants us to know about the eternity, the deity, the creativity, the humanity, the charity, and the authority of Jesus Christ. He's the one, according to the book of Hebrews, that is your high priest. And he exists this day at the right hand of God for you. Look how magnificent He is. And yet Hebrews 8 verse 1 gives us the thesis of that entire New Testament book. And Hebrews 8 verse 1 says, we have a high priest. He's seated at the right hand of majesty on high. The very next verse says, a minister. Look how majestic He is right there next to God, but still He is a minister. And the word minister there in Hebrews 8 verse 2 is the word for a public official. A garbage man. A policeman. A fireman. A patriot serving our nation. A public official. Here he is so majestic right next to God and yet he's there to serve me. He's my minister. Look how great He is. And yet, who He is today, He is for us. How can you not love Jesus seeing how wonderful He is, how great He is, and then 
know how wonderful you are and how great you are to him. We shift in verse 19 to the testimony of John the Baptizer very quickly. And John the Baptizer uses possessive prepositions to give us several descriptors of Jesus. We won't take the time to read the context of them all because we our time is, is running out. But descriptor number one, verse 29, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, watch the segue. Look how magnificent Jesus really is. But He became the Lamb of God to take away your sin. You know, those bad decisions you've made, you know, I've made them too, right? Haven't we both made those bad decisions? And we've had to deal with the consequences of them, haven't we? It's called sin. Transgression, iniquity, wickedness, evil. He took it all away. He took that all away. Do you know why you can get on your knees and say, Our Father which art in heaven? It's not because of your spiritual prowess. It's because of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ has done for you. He's the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Lamb of God, Passover. Right? The second descriptor is in verse 34. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Some manuscripts, perhaps more accurately, say the Chosen of God. Which puts me back in my mind to the day of His baptism when Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 3, heard the words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Or I turn to Mark's account in Mark 1 or Luke's account in Luke 3 and I hear something different. Jesus hears the word, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now either God said, This is my beloved Son and Jesus took that personally or the voice spoke twice. And the voice said, First of all, to Jesus specifically, You're my Son in whom I am so pleased. Hey everybody, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The chosen one. And he wasn't just chosen to be the one that was with whom God was well pleased. He was chosen to be the one who did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. He was chosen to be the one who knew no sin but was made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. He was chosen to be the one in whom God was well pleased and through whom God can become well pleased in you. The chosen one. The third descriptor, verse 34, uh, verse 45. Verse 45. We have found Him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mo uh, Joseph. Isn't that interesting? Now you and I know He wasn't the son of Joseph. Did the Holy Spirit make a mistake? The son of Joseph. As was supposed to be the son of Joseph. Luke 3, verse 23. You read the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus in Luke 3, and you see different names. Why? Because one traces the genealogy of Jesus through his biological surrogate, Joseph, and the other traces the uh, ancestry of Jesus through the lineage of his mother. The Holy Spirit wants us to know that Joseph was in the life of Jesus. I'm preparing some lessons for this coming summer for a particular event, and I'm calling it the couples, plural, who cared for Jesus. The first couple would be Joseph and his biological mother, Mary. And I'm asking the question as young families, would God have placed the Savior of the world into the care of your home? 
The second couple that invested in the life of Jesus was in his adulthood, and that would be his biological mother and his biological, non-biological father, the Holy Spirit. And they both invested in Jesus in his adulthood. Follow the Holy Spirit's involvement with Jesus, and man, that is a fascinating study. But the Holy Spirit wants me to know of the connection Jesus had with humanity. The next descriptor, as we come to a close, would be in verse 49, the Son of God. We've addressed that already in His deity. The uh, fifth descriptor, the King of Israel, also in verse 49, which is attested to repeatedly, of course, in the book of Matthew. And of course, Revelation reveals Him as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the last descriptor would be the Son of Man in verse 51, which is not a reference to His humanity and converse to His deity, the Son of God, the Son of Man, but rather in the Jewish mind, Son of Man would take the Jew all the way back to Daniel 7, where the Ancient of Days God gave to one the sovereignty of a nation with authority over the same. That Son of Man would be the hero of the Jewish nation and people. And Jesus is actually called that. So we see the testimony of John and the testimony of John the baptizer and we come to a conclusion. If you were to step back in the midst of all of these descriptors in the latter portion of John the baptizer's testimony, you have three others. Lord. Pause is He Lord of your life? Why do you make the decisions you make? The answer to that question will answer the first. Messiah, He who is called Christ, the anointed of God. See how special He is to God? Is He special to you? And then, Rabbi, Teacher, are you letting Him teach you who to be, what to do? Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. Let's live what we see. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our Savior Jesus. We're so grateful you loved us enough to send him. So grateful he loved us enough to come. So grateful he gave up everything for us and was willing to do so for all eternity so that we can be with you and with him and with the Spirit for all eternity as well. We can't say thank you enough. We love you. We love him. We love your Spirit. We love your church. We love your word. And we're so grateful we can call you our Father because of our Savior. In His name we pray. Amen.